Every year, thousands of experts evaluate the status of animal, plant, algae, and fungi species around the world. Using a common language of assessment, they categorize each species' risk of extinction on the IUCN Red List. The Red List provides a barometer of life. And every year, the outlook gets worse. More than 31,000 species are currently threatened with extinction. Most because of human action. But human action can also reverse the Red List trend. So conservationists, governments, and communities around the world are joining forces, activating tried and tested IUCN tools in a coordinated effort to assess, plan, and act for wildlife. Together, we can save species from extinction. Together, we can win the fight for our planet's future. Together, we can reverse the red. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to the Reverse the Red webinar, where we continue to explore the question, how can we reverse the trends of red lists of species? And today we're going to focus in on how can we communicate for change? How can we inspire and bring people on this journey? I'm Jenny Gray. I'm the CEO of Zoos Victoria and immediate past president of the World Associations of Zoos and Aquariums. And I'd like to open by paying my respect to the traditional owners of the land from which we gather. I'm joining you from Melbourne in Australia on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect to elders past and present and recognize that we gather on land that has not been ceded by treaty. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today is also a World Wildlife Day, a day when we pause and think about the amazing wildlife that shares this planet and how much they fill our lives with joy and how much we need to change our behaviors for them to all survive with us. I'm joined by a panel of diverse communication experts, all with a clear mission, a mission to make the world a better place for the species that journey with us. The format of tonight, today's discussion is a fireside chat, which may be a friendly debate, a challenge of ideas, and a sharing of their expertise and opinions. And along the way, we're going to be encouraging you, the audience, to also share your questions. Um, and feel free to ask questions by just popping them into the chat messages um, and free to share who you are. As I'm going to introduce the panel, I'd love you to tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. And already, Erin, thank you for joining us from Florida. It's great to know when we have these webinars that we have people from all over the world with the same mission in mind. And so to introduce you to our amazing panel for today, starting out from Washington in the US, we have Kat Cuts, leads communication for Smithsonian's Conservation Commons and their solution-focused Earth Optimism Initiative. Through this initiative and partnership with Reverse the Red, her goal is to help change conservation narrative through storytelling and sharing what's working to move conservation communications away from doom and gloom and towards a positive approach. Also from the US and Washington is Jared Lipworth. Jared is an Emmy award winning producer who has overseen hundreds of hours of science and history and natural history programs. He has deep storytelling experience as an editorial focused production executive writer, commissioning editor, and co-production partner. Jared, that's a real mouthful. You might wanna put less words together there. He's also executive producer and head of outreach and impact at HHMI Tangle Bank Studios. From London, Diogo Verisomo, Verisomo, 
Diogo, you're going to get me right on this. I, I've been battling with your name. You'll make it even better when you chat. Is a okay. conservation marketeer focusing on the use of marketing principles and theories to influence human behavior and mitigate threats to biodiversity. His time is currently shared between On the Edge Conservation and the University of Oxford, where Diogo focuses on the design and evaluation of behavior change initiatives to influence consumers of illegal wildlife pro products. And finally, joining us from Durban, South Africa is Dr. Judy Mann, who is passionate about marine conservation and has focused her career on helping people to care for the oceans. Since 1992, she's worked for the South African Association of Marine Biolo Biological Research in Durban, including a number of senior roles with Ushaka Marine World. Judy is an active member of the World Association of Zoos and Aquarium and president-elect of International Zoo Educators. It is so great to have you all joining us today. And I'm gonna start out saying, are we getting it right? Are we communicating in ways that have impact? As conservationists, we seem to say a lot, but is it really getting through? And Kat, I'd like to start with you. You're an optimistic person. Are you optimistic that our communication is making it through to the right people? I would say that I'm optimistic that we're starting to move in the right direction. That for a long time, conservationists have not been communicating effectively, but that's why these solutions focused movements like reverse the red and earth optimism are so crucial because we've hammered on for decades that biodiversity is in peril with such a pointed focus on just the problems without sharing how we're solving the problems and people wanna see solutions and what's working even in times of crisis. And I think that we have a really great example at Earth Optimism that just last April, when the world had pretty much just shut down, we had 191 million people reached through our Earth Optimism Summit in April. That just shows to me, and I think it's testament that if we change the conservation narrative, we're opening the door for so many more people and opportunities to not just share what's working, but to see those solutions replicated and scaled up. Yeah, no, I just just to add to that. I think I think there's also enormous potential in exploring, um, you know, a number of ways of, of 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 thinking about behavior change that we haven't perhaps fully 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 done that thus far. So, for example, very often we we focus on uh, on individual behavior, um, but we fail to um, make accountable the politicians that we elect for you know the environmental policies they pursue, um, or on the same on the same on on the reverse we focus a lot on companies and try to um, get ourselves off the hook from, uh, you know, the, the impacts that our daily um, lives has, at, le at least us, those of us in, in, in countries with a higher income, where we do have a very high footprint. And so I think it's, it's now time that we, 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 we explore this, that full range of options. So we can, we, we, we understand that we really have no other option than to to change and we need change that is transformative across society from the individual to the higher up level um, governments and businesses and so on. Yeah, I would echo that as well. I think, um, you know, there's so many different ways to tell a story. There's, um, you know, Kat talked about the optimism and uh, a tangled bank. That's the approach we believe in. We believe in providing people with inspiration, with hope that there is still a chance for the, for conservation for our planet. Uh, it's not to say that the, the 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 doom and gloom doesn't have a place as well. You know, there's sort of that combination of both, and understanding what your calls to action are going to be on any given project. Um, you know, it it could be as simple as as inspiration and literacy. It could be about uh, getting personal change. It could be about governmental change. And I think that's where uh, storytelling can have such an impact if you can get your messages to the right people. I think that that's, that's brought in quite an interesting point. And to go back to, to Jenny's point is, are we, are we getting it right? I think we're getting it more right, but I don't think we're getting it right as much as we need to right now. And I think that for a long time, we've worked on raising awareness. So raising awareness has been our sort of mantra. It's been our call to action, so to speak. And I think that now we're getting to the point where we need to move beyond that raising awareness. And I think that that takes us back to the point of really understanding why are we communicating 
communicating as our first point. And I think that often we jump into communication because it's an easy thing to do. I mean, we all people, we communicate without understanding that there's a whole lot more to communicating than just talking and working through that to say, what do we really want to achieve? We can spend an incredible amount of money on our communication without really having a goal in mind, and then we can't measure it. So I think it's understanding firstly, what do we want to achieve? And then who are we talking to? I think that's a great point, Judy. Um, we, we need to understand who we're talking to. And sometimes the message will be quite different depending on, on that target audience. Um, you and I both work in, in worlds, you're in a, aquariums and, and I run as a, a big zoo. We spend a lot of time thinking about our visitors, what the message is, how we talk to them, and, and really trying to use very different mediums. There's not a one size fits all for either every audience or, or every message. Um, but, but how does thinking about the audience change the way you communicate? Um, we're, we're often talking to millions of people when we go out in a, a broad show or sometimes very specifically to fewer people. But how, how do you guys think about audience? And this would be the whole oh, sorry. Go ahead, go the ahead. whole concept of, of audiences is is absolutely critical. And for me, it's been quite an interesting journey because I I've realized over the years working working with people visiting our aquarium is that I've got a pair of, of glasses on. I've got a pair of invisible lenses that I see the world through. And for a very long time, I thought that everybody saw the world through my glasses. And it's taken me a long time to realize that that actually perhaps isn't the case and that everyone looks at the world through their own eyes based on their experiences, where they've grown up, what they do, all sorts of different things, their culture. And it's really important for us to learn to take off our glasses and put on the glasses of somebody else's so that we can see the world through their eyes. And it's, it's important looking at how do we meet people where they are, not where we want to be. Because that's been my biggest lesson is that I think everybody loves nature and my communication is worked on that. And I'm realizing maybe, maybe it's not quite right. So understanding our audiences, doing the research that we need to understand where our audiences are at, and then working our communication messages from that basis as opposed to from our own basis. I just wanted to build on, on that point and just emphasize just how how dramatically different um, uh, people can be in their perspectives of, of of the same issue. You know, sometimes we think of um, this sort of and you know, a lot of universal sort of similarities between people around the world, but the reality is that we all live in very different you know places, realities, contexts. We have different priorities. We like different things, and so it really is it really is the case that it can be dramatically different the way that we perceive uh, an animal, a plant species. Either either for you know it, this, this could go both ways. Either perceive it as being incredibly valuable and important, or being less valuable and less important. And so I really want to echo uh, Judy's point of not 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 making this assumption that um, we are. Uh, we have the higher moral ground us in conservation we we are showing other people how how things need to be done and people just need to copy us in order for the world to be better actually it's the other way around we need to understand how how people's priorities and their reality how does nature connect to them according to that to those that context and how can we fit that our messaging into their um into that reality i think that's really a key thing that we need to adapt to our audiences not expect them to come and meet us where we are well, and I would add to what you just said, Diogo, about it's not just a reflection of us, right? We're always focused on the people who are already conservation minded or already love nature. And something we forget is that we should be expanding that audience because like Judy said, we think everybody loves nature because of, who wouldn't? It's great, right? We want everybody to. And so when we think about like, what's our target audience? Well, our target audience is everybody. Um, and to get to that everybody, eventually, we need to start looking outside of the people we've already been talking to. And I just learned this yesterday, um, very interesting fact, but do you know that the most trusted source of information to Americans is museums? It's mm. not newspapers, nonprofits, not academia, and it's most certainly not the government. It's, it's museums. And I think that we need to start reaching out to museums, partnering with museums, and even using 
some of their communication tools and skills to expand on our audience because we want people to trust our message and trust our solutions. And we also wanna bring a more diverse audience and that's something else that museums have, you know, that interdisciplinary approach. And it's those interdisciplinary approaches to conservation that are creating some of the best solutions. Yeah, I'd also say that it's, it's not a uni there's no universal answer as well, because every piece of communication is different and has, you know, should should have clear goals starting out. Um, you know, we we produce films for PBS and for worldwide audiences, and we understand who those audiences tend to be, not as individuals, but as what they're expecting um, when they turn on the television. We produce worth uh, for short form for digital outlets that have a very different expectation when it comes to the kind of content they're gonna see and the way the content is presented. So, um, you know, I think that's really important as well to understand, um, you know, I think Kat, I think you said to go where the, uh, you know, where the audience is, but also to understand what the expectation is once they're there, um, because there's a lot of different storytelling approaches. Um, I'd also say, you know, there's there's sort of the one extreme where you're trying to hit as many people as possible with any given story. And there's other cases where you're trying to make a film, you know, you could be making a feature film for one person. You know, I've got colleagues who, um, who make films about conservation that are designed to reach the president of a country because they know that they, if they can get that story in front of that person, they could create a new marine protected area. Um, we had a film recently that was designed to really be targeted at a small audience of NGOs and governments to help. Um, this was a film about uh, Gorongosa National Park and how they're setting up this model of conservation that ties human development directly to conservation instead of separating them out into two big buckets. That was a film that was intended for a very specific audience. Um, it turned out it was a film that uh, that was quite powerful and appealed to a, bro a broader audience. And now we're expanding that, but it was never intended for that uh, approach. So, you know, I think one of the early decisions whenever you're trying to communicate is to figure out exactly who you're trying to reach and with what message and build the piece around that. Well, thank you. What great insights into audience. And, and I'm not sure if everyone's watching the chat, but our audience today is right around the globe a few times. I think we have people from almost every corner of the planet joining us because this communicating with people is such an important topic. And, and I think as we get this increased frustration about how dire the situation is, the time frame seems to be getting shorter. And and such diverse insights. I, I'm loving, Kat, that we might be some of the most trusted people on the planet. Isn't that a huge responsibility that we communicate well? But while that's happening, the, the, the world is changing. The media landscape is not what it was. Um, Jared, you and I might be the oldest people on this, this chat. We remember when it was simple, you just put out one press release to the only major paper and they would run it and then you were done. But, but Jared, reflecting on that, the, the, the landscape really has changed quite significantly. What do you think has changed and, and maybe what stays the same? How, how is the world changing around us? Yeah, I mean, it's changed. It seems to change kind of every week with new, new opportunities, new platforms, new places to tell your stories. Uh, and that's a great thing because you can get your story out there. You don't need to get it by the, the gatekeepers at a, a major broadcaster if you want to get your story out there. The problem with that is that the you know the audience is also that much more splintered. So uh, to what I said before about understanding who your audience is, but also about um, you know figuring out where the right location is for your for your project um, and how best to communicate it. I think the other the other issue you know, you know something we pay a lot of attention to at Tangled Bank is is the storytelling behind the story you're telling because. What I find is that um, you know when I started in this business, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to shoot. I didn't know you know. I learned it all by doing it. I learned it all um, by learning from, from from mentors who had spent their careers telling stories. Um, what I find today is that everybody is starting out. The the younger generations are starting out with those skills already in hand. So they already know how to shoot. They already know how to edit. Uh, they know how to post their videos. They know how to go live. All of those things. 
what they don't always necessarily have is that foundation in storytelling. And I think mm -hmm. that can be the difference between a piece that catches on and is, is heard and makes a difference and a piece that is just sort of goes out into the abyss and then, and then gets lost there. So the storytelling behind the story, I think, is, is crucial um, when, you're, when you're trying to have an impact. Well, and I think it's interesting too. I spend a lot of time on social media, I would say more for work than personally. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, as one of those millennials who did grow up on a computer and immersed in using technology, um, I do realize you were talking about me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Use your phone, shoot your video, put it online. Um, but I mean, I, I agree that that's kind of the problem, right? Is that then the people who spend a lot of time doing that are the people that we look up to. Like the, that's who we see as an example. And I've seen with nonprofit marketing a lot that you're trying to mimic that tactic because that's what's popular and that's what's going viral. And that's what you want is you want all those likes and you want all that engagement, but it's, it's kind of going against what we really want people to know and what we really want to tell people about conservation. So I think it's kind of a tricky situation where we're trying to keep up, but we're also doing ourselves a disservice because, I mean, frankly, I don't need another influencer to tell me to not use a straw to save sea turtles. What I want to hear is about someone in a local community telling their story about how their community came up with the solution to save sea turtles. And I think that now that we have this platform and it's open, we need to find more creative ways of letting people tell their stories. And by giving a voice from people who are really saving the planet and making sure that we're amplifying those stories. And Kat, if I could just jump back in for one second, I, I think, um, you know, what's, what's also interesting, you know, you talk about likes and engagement and, uh, you know, when you're talking about impact, those can be lumped together or they can be very, very different. And, um, you know, it, it gets down to uh, do a lot of likes help? Do they make a difference? Or is there deeper engagement that we should be aspiring to mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of watching the whole pieces and then a call to action? And there can be a lot of different calls to action, but, um, you know, we tend to get sucked into the metrics of how many versus what the actual engagement can be sometimes. I have a really quick example of that. Um, <laughs> I think I broke the hearts of some undergraduate students that I'm mentoring because I showed them just a very basic stat on Facebook. And I was like, oh, look, they were like, oh, that post got so many likes. And so I opened up the analytics. I was like, yeah, it did. But how many people clicked on the link? And it was like 200 people might have liked the article, but only eight people clicked. And I'm like, how many do you think actually read it? So it's very superficial. And is that really the goal? Is that really what we want is the likes? I think that that's, that's a really good point that leads me into something slightly different because the media landscape has, has changed dramatically. And the last year has really shown us the power of social media. But to me, what it's also revealed is the absolutely critical importance of real of real life, of real nature. And I think that with, if I, I look at the world's zoos and aquariums and look at it from the, the IZD and the WASA perspective, that's such a valuable resource that we have. And along with museums, zoos and aquariums are often really trusted sources of information. But we have the opportunity to connect people to what is real in a way that can never be done digitally. And I think that that's something that it's important for us not to lose sight of. Sometimes, and we've had to in the last year, go everything digital. And what's come to us very clearly is that people want what's real. People want to be able to see real animals. They want to be able to touch a tree. They want to be able to do something in nature. And I think that that's what we, we mustn't lose track of in all the, the big media landscape. It's absolutely vital. And I think that we're all using it, learning how to use it, learning how to measure its impact, so, so important. But then not losing sight of just being able to let kids, adults enjoy nature for our, our souls, just enjoy nature, just playing in nature is important. It doesn't even have to be deeply educational, just giving kids a chance to spend some time in nature, see what an animal looks like in real life. So media, I really believe in, but I also really, really believe in, in the, the reality of what we're able to, to offer. 
Let me just follow up to that point because I, I want to I want to make sure that because I feel sometimes in conservation we feel in, fall into this the these dichotomies of one thing or the other and I've I've come across certainly a lot of discussions um, in the last year year and a half around this. Uh, real versus virtual nature, and to what extent does virtual um, uh, is it, is it helpful if we have all these representations online and and of virtual nature? And I think at this point we really need both of them, right? We want to make sure that we these things complement and feed into each other. Um, and so, for example, at the Edge Conservation, we're focusing uh, on online games, for example. And and I, it's really I think a huge an, an area that's untapped by a lot of conservationists when we think about the fact that in the next two or three, four years, about half of the planet's population will be playing games, digital games. And so there's a, it's a big, big outlet that we can, we can find that to, to take our messages out. And particularly very much to, to, to Kat's point of very often social media, it's very easy to get 200 likes, 200 likes probably from people who already knew the message that you were trying to get across, already are on board what you're saying. But with games, for example, and other virtual platforms, I feel like sometimes we can much, much more easily um, get into the, uh, the hands or the minds of people who probably wouldn't sit down and watch a documentary, probably wouldn't sit down and go to a natural history museum. Um, and so it's, I think those two, those two things are, are, are quite complementary. And I'll, I'll just end with a, one, one point, I think, to Jared's initial point, which I think one of the key challenges of these, all these new platforms and all these new formats is not only to keep up, but also just the amount of information, right? Any, any regular user on Facebook, Twitter gets so much information, right? And so it's no longer just the two or three or four sources of information that you're dealing with and compete with each other. Everyone is sharing so much content that you, in order for you to cut through the clutter and actually get people to notice what you're saying, um, it becomes that much bit harder. And so I think that's just, you know, just something else we have to, to grapple with because it's not going away. It's going to stay. It's probably going to get more competitive. Yeah, really great points. It's, um, it's almost scary to think of the communication channels we had 10 years ago and, and how poor they were compared to what we have now. And if there's this exponential rate of change into the future, um, they're just going to get even more, you know, more and faster communications. And so that richness, the grabbing someone in that moment where they're most open, um, it's all about tone and timing and, and how you set that message up. And, and Diogo, in, in setting up a communication, and, and I can't even imagine how you do this through gaming, but, but do you have some top tips? And I'm, I'm keeping a little bit of an eye on the questions that are coming through from our audience and, and really to the audience, keep them flowing. If we don't answer them as we're chatting, we do have a transcript and we'll try and get back to you. Um, but Diogo, what do you think about in terms of tactics and tone when you're trying to communicate? What would be your top tips for everyone? Well, um, let's see. I mean, I, I think we, we've touched a lot on uh, already on a lot of really important applied things that, that we can all make sure that we use in our daily, so everyday, um, you know, work. So, you know, things like having a really clear goal, for example, it's 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 sometimes very easy for us to, um, you know, biodiversity is in crisis. We need to act now. Time is running out, right? So this is crisis mentality, which you know, I I, I feel the anxiety, right? So I, I I share that 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 sentiment, but at the same time, it's really really important that we we do things in a sort of in, in a planned. We have we have strategy behind what we do, um, because otherwise, it's it's, it's not that just. It, that could be not as effective as you would like is it could make things worse, right? And so mm. um, really understand, really have a clear goal, understand who it is you're trying to communicate. And of course then, uh, you know, make sure that, um, for example, your, your channels that you're using, right? So if, you, you, if you're communicating with a really young audience, Facebook's probably not gonna be a very good channel, right? Because that audience is not there. If you communicate with 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 uh, policymakers, TikTok's probably not going to be a very good channel. I mean, I'm using really sort of extreme examples, but all I'm saying is that this happens quite regularly, right? So this this mismatch um, um, happens, and, and it's really easy for a message to get lost and for um, for for us not to hit the target, right? And so I think you know from from having a clear goal. Um, and um, you know, understanding who you're talking with, then just understanding very much like we were in the beginning saying, you know, understanding who it is, walking a mile in our audience's shoes. You know, that's sort of a little bit the way I like to think about it. Really understand what it is that um, that we are um, that we're trying to get across and who it is we're trying to get it to. I think those maybe those three things are some of the top things that I I, I think about when I'm starting any new project. I think just to to 
to um, fit in with what you're what you're saying, Diogo, is that that what are you trying to achieve and who is your audience? So I love Earth optimism. It's it's one of my most favorite things, and especially ocean optimism coming from a marine environment. And I've I've really worked on trying to move our messages and moving from from loss to love. So that whole concept of, of really preaching about love and not loss, because we've spoken so much about loss. And we found that in, in some cases where we really are just telling people everything's everything's terrible, there's no hope. And, and that's not inspiring. So I love the optimism message. And then having a chat to, to Jenny and some others a little while ago, she said, well, actually, if you're trying to raise money and you're trying to put the profile of your organization up there, actually loss is really pretty useful. Because if you tell funders, actually, things are going well and we've got some really good news stories, they go, OK, well, let's go and find something that's not working so well. So um, an example from Jenny's side would have been the, the, bush, the bushfires in Australia. That, that really did generate a, a lot of money for conservation. And I think it's a really fine balance. And it comes back to knowing what are we trying to achieve and who is our target audience and making sure that we match those very, very carefully. I was horrified that loss could be such a good thing. But as conservation organizations, it's used a lot in order to, to generate publicity and to generate funding. So again, it's coming back, Diogo, to your point, matching your goal and your audience and making sure that they fit, fit together. Yeah. And, I, sorry. I was just going to say, and matching your language. When, when we talk optimism, mm. we use very different words to when there's moments of loss or disaster. Um, and again, you know, what we are going to see more and more of is climate emergencies. And when these happen, like the, the polar vortex in the US just in the last two weeks, devastating wildlife. And, and so these are moments where optimism would jar. So, so getting that right, Judy, I, I absolutely agree. Sorry, Jared, I interrupted you there. No, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I would say kind of two points here. I think, um, you know, there's room for both, that you need both. Um, you know, we as a production company have, made the strategic decision to tell those positive stories, to go out and find those ones that can inspire people um, to recognize that there is still hope. So, you know, that's a decision we made, but understanding that there are plenty of other people who are telling very, very powerful stories about loss as well. Um, I think the other element that we need to think about more and more these days is the, the increased polarization of audiences and the increased amount of misinformation that's out there. And, you know, it's easy in the U.S. to think politics for that, but it, it, it works across, uh, you know, all content and conservation as well. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a challenge to not only be trusted, as, as Kat said, with the museums, um, but to be able to get to those audiences who are not normally going to tune in to hear your side of the story. I always joke, and this may be a US reference that others won't get, but if we could find the right stories to appeal to the REI crowd and the Cabela's cloud, the crowd, those are two very, very different crowds who both love the outdoors. Um, but for very different reasons and have very different approaches. If we can find ways to reach both either together or separately, then you're, you know, then you're getting beyond your tent and you're reaching out to, um, to bigger audiences and trying to grow audiences. So it, it does, it comes down to understanding what, being very strategic about what your messaging is and then what your audience is expecting in terms of how to tell that story. I, and I think that we can get the REI crowd and the Cabela's crowd to come together because they both love the same thing, right? Like you said, they both love nature and the outdoors. And I think that's where these optimism movements fit in. It's for putting those kinds of audiences together because when you're focusing on what the solution is, then they both see the positive outcome. They both say, okay, we well, are saving the outdoors. I love the outdoors. And so I think optimism becomes like a misnomer to people that are, first introduce these movements just by the hashtag or just by hearing about it because optimism in these movements like reverse the red we're not ignoring that species are being lost and that there's peril what we're doing is saying we want for the ones that are in loss we want to use these solutions we want to replicate these actions that have worked and so i think that using that tactic and using that communication is saying recognizing that there's something wrong that we need to fix but we can fix it and so we need your support and that works for such a different 
a much wider audience than people who traditionally have been in conservation. And because that's the big game, right? The game is not just to spark curiosity and, and raise awareness. Our, our goal is really collective action. It's getting 8 billion people to think differently about one or two things that might be straws, Kat. Um, but, but we're starting to see governments pass legislation here in Australia against single-use plastic. We, we start to see that when we can get enough citizens to get really on a roll to really pick up an issue, governments, policymakers, and even more importantly, industries start to pay attention. Um, and, and we had a, a big win last year with a major chocolate producer. And their key motivation when they came and saw us to remove palm oil from their product was that their employees were starting to be embarrassed. They didn't want to go to barbecues and say where they worked because the public sentiment was shifting against them. And, and Judy, you've studied this. You've studied how we bring about social change. Um, and, and I can see from lots of the questions, there's lots of interest in this. How do we move beyond talk? How do we do this? How do we start doing campaigns that really change behavior? I think that, I mean, campaigns have got such an important role to play. And I think that we're all starting to, to see the value of, of campaigns. And I think that everyone has a different definition of a campaign. So in the past, we maybe thought of a campaign as being sort of save, save the whales as a campaign. And we're starting to see many and many different types of, of campaigns now. So we found in just from our side, one of our campaigns really worked on an emotional connection. And I think that this is something that we often underestimate in, in everything of, that we communicate is the incredible power of emotion and building an emotional connection to an animal as being an important driver. And research with our visitors has said that that emotional connection, as well as wanting to do something better for their children or their grandchildren, was one of the most important drivers of people taking up and sustaining a, a behavior change for, for positive environmental behavior. But I think that one of the most successful campaigns has really been one that's been spearheaded by aquariums around the world, and that's to do with sustainable seafood because it started off really small where it was about helping people to choose sustainable seafood and giving them the tools to do that. But that has now become so much bigger working from the fishing floor and, and the fishing boats, working with the fishing industry, right the way through to working with ships and everything in between. And we're starting to see how the demand for sustainable seafood is actually driving changes in how fish are harvested. Obviously, we've got a long way to go to improve where we are with, with the world's fisheries, but it is an example of a campaign that's had a much, much bigger impact across a much wider range of, of the whole industry than, than ever before on many other campaigns. So I think that that's one good example of a campaign that really has gone beyond its initial scope. So campaigns absolutely have an important role. Um, I'm not, not generally keen on the campaigns that involve protesting, but sometimes those do have a role too. But I think that if we can achieve our goals working with communities, working with people and, and trying to work with industry, I think that we've got a much better chance of having a sustainable change. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I think, you know, it's something I wrestle with a lot as a storyteller is, you know, there's, there's room for literacy, there's room for inspiration. Um, as an individual, I want to feel like I can have some power. But then sometimes it's also overwhelming to think that no matter what I do, you know, nothing's going to change unless corporations change, unless governments change. So finding that balance where you can be pushing, you can be the general public can feel that they are empowered to push for change where it actually matters is, is the key. And, and that's, that's a really hard thing. I think, Judy, you gave some great examples of, of where it's working. Um, but there's a lot of others where it, it's not yet and where it needs to if true change is actually going to come about. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Jared. I think that when we want these collective actions to happen, we need to think about how we're communicating for that. Because so often the way that we communicate for these little behavior changes is that we're putting the onus on the person instead of trying to bring people together for them together collectively to put the onus where it belongs on these corporations, on the governments, the ones that actually have to make the change. And so I think that when we communicate about these things like straws is 
an example that always comes up to me because it's an inequitable way that we talk about it. And we say we wanna make conservation more equitable, but then we make these demands of people instead of making the demands for a city to get rid of single use plastic or a corporation to stop handing it out. I would just follow that with saying, I, I, th I think we, we need to be, and I realize in some countries, conservation is already highly politicized and polarized, and that's maybe not the most helpful thing. But at the same time, if I, I do feel that sometimes we, we as uh, conservationists shy away from, from talking about um, voting and, and how that impacts decision making. So sometimes we're not very straightforward and very open about the fact that, yeah, I mean, if, if people, if we if we vote in people that have the right environmental policies, we will have a uh, really positive impact. And that's a really key way of achieving change. Um, and so I, know I, I do think that we need to be um, clever, I think, uh, a little bit cleverer in terms of how we, um, how we engage with that, all, that, all those uh, decision makers and, um, and, and that process. That is, of course, it is easier to uh, focus on the individual because, of course, we're um, it's at a much smaller scale, and I do think that individual change can be important, but of course we need the full spectrum. We need to also engage these bigger decision makers, and I think sometimes we've shied away from from that the more more sensitive, more controversial sort of uh, arena. Um, but I think we I think time time is now for us to be engaged in those conversations as well. And that, that's such a great point, and and I think we forget we we're voters and. Um, a lot of politicians, when asked why they're not taking decisions that are pro-environment, they say, because no one comes to see me or tell me that I should. Um, they, they're listening and taking the pulse of their electorate. And if the pulse of their electorate talks about jobs and health and never talks about the environment um, because they think someone else has got it, they won't vote. But we've been quite academic up to now. I, I'd like to spend some time with you, Diego, on you're an expert in demand reduction. And I know from previous webinars, this is something that people hold very dear to their hearts, the illegal trafficking of, of animals. So let, let's take this to a really practical example. How, how do we go about communicating in an area that's just so difficult? It's, it's way beyond, as Kat said, any individual other than just don't buy wildlife. But I think we're preaching to the converted. I can't believe that there's anyone on this webinar who's actually supporting an illegal trade. Diogo, how do we start thinking about this and how are you guys working to change this? Well, I mean, I, I, maybe I'll just start by saying that actually because of the complexity of the wildlife trade, um, I would say that almost actually all of us in, in this webinar almost guaranteed are consumers of some product that is maybe not illegal but unsustainable. I mean, it is, it is, if you think about the vastness of wildlife, you know, across plants, animals, and fungi, right? There's all these you know, thousands of products that each of us interacts with every, every day um, that has the potential to be, to be part of these, these supply chains, right? So I think that's, that's you know, really, I think, an important thing for us to, to bear in mind. But in terms of our, our work, really, it's, it's really uh, focusing on um, how can we, uh, understand better the motivations that drive a lot of these um, uh, individuals that are that that use these products for whatever reason, um, and try to um, influence that that behavior towards more towards more sustainable alternatives. Now, of course, I think that the complexity of this, and very much with COVID, we you know the wildlife trade is very much in um, in the spotlight, and we know that um, we we getting a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of calls for ending ending the trade, you know, all of that. But of course, there is there are lots of complexities around um, why 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 is it that people uh, use a particular product? And of course, maybe maybe it's completely up to them, and they completely you know they have multiple choices they can use. Um, but that's not also um, always the case, right? Um, for the case uh, of wild meat, for example, we have situations where people it is an important source of protein, and so there are all these complexities, and really that we try to understand and unpack a little bit more um, to try and understand understand how what alternatives people have right it, because it's very easy for us as conservationists people have a particular perspective and you know, point of view to say what you're doing is wrong you have to change but it's more complicated to then say okay what did that what does that change on the ground actually look like right so if you have a consumer in whatever country it might be um there's using a product um what what is that 
what is what is that alternative world look like where that person does something else, right? How, how we can how can we get there? Um, and so that's been that's really been the, the work that we are doing in collaboration with you know partners around the world. Um, and and you know I think that that local element is also really important. You know I, I'm here sitting, sitting in the UK um, talking about this really global issue. I should really I should really uh, have started by saying that uh, all the work that we do on this is really um, about partnerships because it is about understanding local realities of why people make certain decisions and not some other decisions, right? They could have made, but they don't. Um, and so that's really, I think, um, uh, where we're coming from with, with with some of this work. And really just emphasize that, um, you know, it is, it is more a little bit more complex than it might seem at face value. You know, why would people use a medicine made of some endangered species, for example, right? It just seems maybe from all of us, we just don't, wouldn't quite understand why that why people would make those choices, but the reality is that you know if you if you flip the script a little bit and you have a relative, maybe a close relative who's really ill, um, and you've gone through, you know you 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 of course care deeply about this person and you're looking for solutions, trying to make the person feel better, um, you can explore all the options available, uh, right? And then so all of a sudden the fact that species X or Y is endangered, maybe that's not the first thing in your mind anymore. Maybe that's not the thing that drives your decision-making anymore, right? So, um, and so I think it's also through this empathy um, and understanding of the people we're trying to communicate with that uh, we hope to sort of then, then drive these choices towards more sustainable um, alternatives. And I like what you said about flipping and trying to understand when people get to that point of, well, I don't care if it's in danger, I wanna save my family. And I think I think that's interesting because I've never thought about that personally, but one thing that I do think of often when we talk about wildlife trade and trying to change these behaviors is that we're coming from a totally different culture and area of understanding and conservation is rooted in colonialism. We need to decolonize conservation big time. And sometimes we say we mix up hunting and poaching those aren't the same things. So I think that there's a lot of communication that we need to do to help people understand what these differences are and to understand the nuances like you pointed out. Coming from Africa, Kat, I cannot agree more with you. And I think that that's a really critical point. It's really, really easy to sit and point fingers at people for what they do on the ground without really understanding the context that they're working in. And I mean, from an African perspective, working with communities, living on the ground, living with wild animals. It's, it's really easy to expect Africa to look after the wildlife that people want to go on holiday to see without the reality of actually living there. And I think that we have to be so careful of, of making blanket statements that are not necessarily true. And sometimes these blanket statements and viewpoints can lead to massive action that can really ultimately do more harm than good on the ground. And I think that it's really important just to keep very, very aware of the implications of the actions and what we do without being fully conversant with what happens on the ground and what the implications of those actions are. Because we could be actually harming conservation in the big picture more by some of the actions that we're looking at. So demand reduction is a really complex thing, as Diogo said, and we need to understand what we're wanting and what we're really asking for and what the implications are for the people living on the ground with the wildlife. Which I think is also why, it, you know, sort of for me, it comes full circle back to Gorongosa, just as one example of a place that is embracing, you know, to, to, to Diogo's point about the local element, to Kat's point about the, you know, decolonizing conservation, conservation and hu human development can't be looked at separately anymore. You have to look at a place, you, you have to look at a place and understand how you can both conserve and make it beneficial pe for the people around. And that's not necessarily the answer to illegal poaching and to wildlife trade, but it's one answer. And, uh, you know, I think of Gorongosa again as an example, um, they're now in a situation where people call them from the local markets when they see illegal pangolins being traded because they know that this, it benefits themselves, it benefits their communities to be embracing what Gorongosa brings to the table for them. So, and there's lots of other places that are doing similar, but that connection, that sort of commitment from the front to conservation and human development together 
is, I, I believe, is the answer to that decolonization of conservation. And it's got to be something that, that's, that's local and that matters to, uh, to create a sense of pride, to create a sense of ownership, and to create sustainable development and sustainable conservation uh, in any community that, or any conservation area that is, that is trying to be successful. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, just to, just to oh, chip in there, we've, we've so often looked at as being conservation or people. And I think that now it's looking at as conservation for people, because ultimately that's the only way we're all going to benefit. And it, I mean, with our rural communities in, in Africa, the conservation and the people are, are one, they're together. And how do we help both move forward? Thank you. Uh, this has been an incredible discussion. I, I'm not sure you noticed how much ground the four of you have managed to cover in a very short space of time, but we've really worked our way through a lot of thorny questions. Um, and if you've had the opportunity to even watch the comments that have been coming up, there's an incredible conversation going on in the side. And I, I don't think any of you mentioned, Jared, that you have to be able to look, listen, and read simultaneously across multiple platforms in this new world of ours. Um, before I, I start closing down, I do have my favorite question that I'm going to ask each of you. Um, and we'll start with Kat and then work our way around the panel. But my question of if you are all powerful and you don't have to limit yourself to just speaking better or conservation when you answer this question. But if you were all powerful and in order to save species on the planet, what would you change? And Kat, I'm going to start with you. A, it's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I think for one thing, we need to make conservation more equitable. Um, I, I really truly believe that we say it a lot, but we don't actually do anything about it. And I've noticed people calling us out in the chat, which I appreciate that we're talking about decolonizing conservation and we're a very beige panel. Um, so I think, I think we need to do so much more to make this field more diverse and more equitable and we need to make sure that people understand that we want to hear everyone's voice in conservation um you now so if i were to change the world i guess i would take david attenborough's advice and i would curb excess capitalism by getting rid of it and <laughs> giving us a very sustainable planet awesome jared if you were all powerful what would you do yeah that is a tough one uh you know I, i'm gonna go to sort of human nature. Um, I, I think for me to see the kind of results that we're all hoping for, um, I would like to change the human inclination to instant gratification, to profit and power, so that it's, um, you know, and change that to a, a, an appreciation of the common good, an appreciation of the fact that we've only got one planet. Um, you know, there is no plan B for, for Earth. So um, we need to change some basic human instincts uh, to really see significant change. No pressure, Judy. So far, they've changed consumption and they've changed human nature. So no pressure at all. What would you be changing? I, I think that Kat and Jared have got really, really good, good plans to, to change. Mine are, I think, a little bit more modest. What I would love to see is all of us in conservation across all the conservation movements actually working together. If we could put aside our logos and put aside our egos and actually all speak with one voice and amplify our messages, I think that we'd be able to achieve so much more. I think we'd be able to achieve things at government level and we'd be able to achieve them at industry level. And I, I truly believe that there are millions of people out there who really want us to get it right. And they're looking to us to reverse the red. We, we're the ones who should be not, not working against each other, but working together because together we can reverse the red. But we're going to have to really decide what we want to achieve and we want to work together on it. So if I was all powerful, I would have us all working together and powerfully really driving our conservation work with communities and really working together with the communities. That, that would be my dream. Thank you, Judy. And Diogo, they've, they've left you lots of space. What would you change? 
Well, I mean, I, th I think in a world where we've uh, we moved on from from a capitalist system where we've tackled human human biases and we're all working together as a conservation movement, I think you know I think we've been a pretty good place already. Um, I, I think my 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 wish for change would be something, um, I guess, relatively minor, and that that would be just for us to. I, th I think a lot of us and, and have uh, as as individuals have really. If, almost regardless of where we live, even if we live in the most urbanized of environments, have had some, you know, um, exciting and 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 and, and sort of uh, important experiences with some element of nature. It might be a tree, it might be a bird, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but I think we do lose lose some of those the memories of of how important those moments were and those interactions were and that emotional impact. Um, and I I really wish that we could. Um, we could be better at reviving that, that and rekindling that that emotion, that connection, um, because I think to one one of the earliest points, um, you know, very much we sometimes we tend to be a little bit too much of uh, of a scientist, I think, and try to you know go at things with facts and figures. But in, and at the end of the day, it's going to be what what we feel that's going to get us um, to reverse the red. Thank you so much, all of you. What what great answers and and what a great discussion we've had today. For Reverse the Red, we're still an emerging organization. We need all the communication specialists that we can get on board. And so delighted to have you all joining us. And, and I'm just loving the comments that have come through and, and so many of our audience engaged. For us, the next step is our launch, which will be coincided with the World Conservation Congress. Um, and we'd be inviting all of you to join the party. It is going to be a good one when we launch Reverse the Red. We're currently engaging with pilot nations and building teams of skilled professionals in what are being called centers for species conservation. And you may have seen um, Carmel talking in the last webinar we did. And our next webinar is going to really highlight these centers for species survival. We are sharing the skills and tools and hope based around the one plan approach of Assess Plan Act. There is a Reverse the Red website. So if you would like to find out a bit more about what we're doing, and then we're also sharing stories of hope, stories of where this is working really well and where we're seeing those trends turn around. Because as we know, and as, as many of the panelists have talked about, when we do work together, we can make a difference. Just having a single focus and doing that really well, there's a lot of us. Um, and so we don't need to keep thinking we're a, a, um, the minority. We're not. The most people really want this to work. So we would like to see all of you joining us wherever you can. I'd like to do a specific shout out and thank you to Smithsonian who run these webinars for us. HHMI, website design, San Diego Zoo have been working very hard on case studies. Um, the team at WASA, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the absolutely awesome SSC team that's led by John Paul Rodriguez. All of these people are making a huge difference to keeping this going. I really suggest you don't want to miss our next webinar. So keep an eye out for the invitation and keep an eye out for the date. We'll be talking to the people that are starting to bring Reverse the Red to life. Teams of dedicated scientists trained and skilled in how to do the assess, plan and act. Um, they are all over the world. We are getting up to our 10th Center for Species Conservation. And so in a really short space of time, Kira has done an incredible job of corralling, cor no, saying the wrong word, getting us all together um, and making sure we work in unison. And if you have a question, what should I be doing? What can I do to start getting involved? That will all become clearer in the next webinar. So please join me in thanking this amazing panel. I promised an interesting conversation. I've also given them much more free reign than I usually give these webinars and you guys were fantastic. It, it really was wonderful to hear the comments, to hear you all working and, and talking together on these topics. I want to remind everyone that we're powerful. We are all, each and every one of us powerful. We consume, we vote, we live, we talk, we interact with others. And the ways we do that makes a difference. We make a difference every single day. Um, and today is World Wildlife Day. I'm going to encourage each of you to go out and talk to three or four or five people and just remind them how amazing the wildlife on this planet is. And everything from the big and charismatic through to the little crawling things that pro um, bring joy and, and terror to our lives. So ask, what can I do? What can I say to a politician? What can I say to an organization and write a letter? And I take so much inspiration from children. 
they write to us all the time. And in the last month, I got a letter from a 10 year old who asked me, what is Zoos Victoria doing to reduce your carbon footprint? And she was not letting us off the hook. If a 10 year old can ask questions like that of a CEO, anyone can ask these questions. And so I would encourage you to hold to account the companies you buy from and the people you talk to, the politicians you vote for. Thank you all. I hope everyone has a wonderful wildlife day. Thank you to this amazing panel. And I look forward to seeing you all again in about a month and a bit's time when we talk to the specialists around the world making a difference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.